Representative Barnes. Here. Representative Hurst. Here. Cornejo. Present. Curtis. Fitzpatrick. Parr. Here. Hubbard. Messenger. Here. Minton. Here. Escovo. Six being present, we have court to start. Uh, we have seven bills to hear today. They are all related to the general topic of ethics. We're going to handle this in a similar way uh, for which this committee, we have some crossover members from last session, handled uh, I think Medicaid bills and I think a couple other areas where we had a bunch of bills on a single topic and that is we will open the floor on all of the bills from a single sponsor at one time give members of the committee a chance to ask questions individually to the sponsor for each individual bill and then open it up uh, for testimony to members of the public on the four bills as a whole asking if you're testifying to specify which particular bill you are testifying to um, rather than have seven separate instances of people having to come up and back up and back uh, we'll do it all in, in one go through. Uh, Are there any questions about that procedure, which we've followed in the past? Seeing none, we will proceed. Representative Rout <coughs> will open the hearing on House Bills 221, 223, 220, and 225. Your odd bills. Your odd numbers. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, Caleb Brown, representative of the 44th District. Uh, starting with House Bill 221, uh, which is, uh, all of these actually are uh, fa fairly simple in nature, I think. Uh, House Bill 221 reenacts a provision that was uh, previously in law uh, before being thrown out by the courts of 2010. Simply says that any contribution in excess of uh, $500 is received by a statewide official or a legislator or candidate for those offices during our session uh, has to be reported within 48 hours. Um, I think given the nature of the work we do in Jefferson City and the, the, the wide variety of issues we encounter, um, this is a good common sense measure just to give a little bit broader a view to uh, the general public about the work that we're doing. Um, and that is, that is basically the gist of that, uh, that particular one. So we take questions now, Mr. Chairman, yeah. or go through all of them. Let's go for questions. Yeah, be willing to take any questions. Uh, you said, was that a Hammerschmidt problem? Yep. Okay. Questions of the sponsor on House Bill 221. Rep Representative Mitten. Uh, thank you, Chair Fire. Proceed. Uh, good afternoon, Representative. I have a question about the just the, uh, the drafting of paragraph two, and really my question is, are you amenable to tightening that up? In that, um, wait a minute. Actually, it's uh, page one, line, I guess it starts on line one, 130.044. Okay. All individuals and committees required to file disclosure reports shall electronically file any, for, electronically report any contrib contribution by a single contributor which exceeds $5,000 to the Missouri Ethics Commission within 48 hours. Some might interpret that, that it's, you're talking about contributions to the Missouri Ethics Commission, which certainly wouldn't happen, but I would like to know if you're okay with sort of moving that around because it's, language is, it's different in every other paragraph and it doesn't have that issue. So in other words, if you go to the next paragraph, it says, uh, Shall electronic report any contrib contribution exceeding 500 made by any con contributor to his campaign committee during the session? So uh, what I would like to do is to is to is to do the same thing to the very to the opening paragraph. Yeah, I'm to certainly indicate. open to language. I, I think that you'd have a problem, but that was just yeah, sort of the first I thing. I think they came. used. I'm pretty sure they used the language. It was actually in law, which doesn't necessarily mean it was. And they might have, right. since it was thrown yeah. out. It was never, and, and, and it's it's a picky in point, but right. I still think yeah. that it needs to be clear that we're talking about contributions. To committees sure. and not to ethics, which I don't Given think would ever happen situation. anyway. That's that's a whole other problem. So. <laughs> and this is 221. Yes, ma'am. Then I also um, actually no. I think that the only other question I have is on a different bill. So okay. that's it. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions, <coughs> sponsor. Seeing none, let's open the hearing on House Bill 223. Uh, House Bill 223 um, is another fairly simple, I, I believe, reform bill. It stipulates that 
any elected f official whose name, voice, or likeness is used in a public advertisement uh, paid for with any source of public revenue must include a disclaimer uh, letting the public know that taxpayer funds were used uh, to, to produce or buy ad space for that particular advertisement. I think we've seen a number of cases recently. I've seen a few of them where uh, pretty prime real estate ads have been bought for Mizzou basketball games, Mizzou uh, on, on TV and radio, uh, and some other instances I've heard of uh, where, where some, some pretty prime real estate was being used for some of these ads. And, and certainly we're, the, the ads themselves aren't, aren't ill-advised and, and they, you know, they're, they're um, highlighting things that that particular office is doing. Um, but knowing the amount of, of money it takes to purchase those spots, uh, I think one can make an argument that, that these officeholders are possibly uh, utilizing public funds to, to maybe boost name ID that would obviously be beneficial then come uh, re-election time. So it's, it's certainly not the intention of the bill to stop the practice, but again, just to provide more clarity, a fuller picture uh, to uh, the, the folks in Missouri of, of how these ads are financed. And I would assume that if this passes that it would um, you know, probably make a, a, a statewide office holder think twice before doing it, and, and, and they certainly still may. But again, if they do so, and it being their prerogative, the, the public, I think, has a better understanding of, of uh, how it's being financed and, and is able to judge that accordingly. So uh, with that being said, I'd definitely be willing to answer any questions. Questions and response regarding House Bill 223. Representative Mitt. To inquire again. Proceed. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, sure. and and honestly, uh, in full disclaimer, I have not gone to check the definitions myself, so they may be there, and I'm just not aware. Sure. But for instance, you talk, the bill, the language uses the term any elected official, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's defined someplace else in statute, if it's confined to representatives or statewides or senators. <coughs> but for instance, I have a husband that happens to be a member of a school board. So does that mean that when the board sends out a letter saying, by the way, someone tried to kidnap a kid in our district, that that must have the disclaimer? Because it's signed by an elected official in his capacity as the president of a board of education. Uh, well, I would assume that, um, and I don't know this for sure, it, it, it begs a question that probably needs to be answered, but uh, I would assume that communication by an entity as opposed to a communication by a, an individual well, what's the difference? That's my question. Is that it, is is that it's being signed by an individual, and and, and that's and that's sort of sure. that's my concern. I, I'm, I'm not trying to argue yeah, the uh, that's a fair point. you know the policy, but I do have concerns. Again, it's more technical about the language, how far it extends, whether the term elected official is in fact defined. If we need to tighten that up, I exactly. Sure Does this mean also that, for instance, all of the representatives I assume send out publications as part of their duties here, and that can range from. I mean, I've done a survey, I suspect most of us have, um, to uh, information for senior citizens. Mm -hmm. Would all of those communications then also have to have the disclaimer? Yeah, it is my understanding that it would. Okay. So I guess that's my, you know, you mentioned uh, Mizzou, at, you know, prime advertising, and, and that's kind of what I'm just curious about. What is the, I guess, what's the problem and how, what, what, uh, to how far it extends and how does this fix it? I guess that's really the broader question. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I mean, are we concerned about Mizzou football? Are we concerned about my legislative reports? Are we concerned about my husband's school board letter saying uh, there was an attempted at child abduction? Well, I think that if there is, if there is a circumstance in which in which a, a large amount of taxpayer dollars are being used in in any particular case to uh, you know it's one thing to send out a legislative report to uh, someone's district it's another thing to buy i think uh, uh prime real estate in, in on a sporting event that's going to go out to potentially you know tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of, of people um and again this is not meant to uh, i'm not i'm not trying to chastise anybody i'm not trying to say that this practice can't continue but i do think uh, in, in general, uh, we're talking about ethics reform, we're talking about more transparency. I think the process of folks, uh, it, it, our constituents having a broader understanding of how our system works and how, how ads are being purchased, how things like that are, are coming about, for them to have that knowledge uh, in my mind is a good thing, regardless of, of, of who it is. And I don't, I, you know, again, I, I, don't, I don't, I have no issue with the transparency of it, but again, you know, and I don't know how, you know, for instance, is, what is disseminated to the general public? If I have a senior newsletter that goes out to 100 constituents, or a senior newsletter that goes out to 5,000 constituents, 
are they both general public? If I have one happy birthday letter to one constituent that's paid for with a stamp that I bought <coughs> for my 700 account, do I have to have the disclaimer on that? Um, those, are the, those are my questions, and, and they are more technical in nature, but uh, I, I, don't know that, I don't know that there exist adequate definitions to follow the language of this. And I, and I understand that I believe, you know, some of the, maybe not this particular bill, but uh, I know that some of your bills were just following uh, a bill that was passed in 2010 and then overridden by the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Um, and then the other question that I have is, again, what is the definition of public sources of revenue? Um, I, I think that we can all surmise and, and, and have a good understanding, just a layperson's understanding of that, but I don't know if there's something more technical along those lines as well. Or the same thing for discretionary funds. So, anyway, th those are my concerns about the bill. And again, it's not with the it's not with the ultimate goal. I don't believe, yeah, but just how far does it reach? Does the dog catcher <laughs> that sends out a uh, printing to say how here's what our leash law is and here's how you can control your dogs? Do they have to have the disclaimer on everything when it's so clearly coming from? Um, in my instance, it would be you know St. Louis County or the municipality, and 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 what are the penalties if you don't do it? So, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, let me let me comment or question. Let's talk about that because I think there's multiple ways to. You've identified issues with the definition, which I think the sponsor would agree to. It. There are multiple ways I think to to get at that problem. Um, we could set a threshold amount yeah, for the, I think the way it's drafted now to the general public covers advertisements, but not the letters with a specific name on the letter, because that is a communication to a specific person and not to the general public. Does and maybe it, to our there's, friends a, at? there's a, there's a point at which there are enough individual form letters that go out that it becomes a general public communication. But there's certainly a, a point before that where it's, it's not a general public communication. Any elected official, I think that's pretty obvious. It's, it is any elected official, but um, what would be wrong with, I guess my question for you is, do you see an argument for tightening any elected official? I'm not sure. No, absolutely that. not. Yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 <coughs> as as a lot of these bills are, these are all you know starting points, and, and I, I don't believe, given your line of questioning, that you're you know opposed to it in principle. Mm -hmm. But it's just more a matter of you know how we how we get to the the definition that actually gets to the outcome that we're trying to get to, and to the extent that you know anybody has input to make get to that point, I'm I'm wide open. Thank you. Further questions. Represent her. Proceed. I'm not familiar with the advertisement. In the advertisement, was it just the person dressed in everyday clothes, or did they have on something that distinguished them possibly as an elected official? Uh, no, it would be, I mean, other than, I mean, obviously it would say, yeah, I am ABC, and I am this, uh, I occupy this office, and here's what I'm, uh, I'm on your TV or I'm on your radio today tell, telling you about whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's not really, uh, and they're all a little bit different, but I'm, I'm not sure there would be any other than other than the label of this is this is who I am. You know, I'm not sure there's any distinguishing. Uh, yeah. And that question gets me to another question. Maybe we ought to consider broadening it beyond elected officials so that it includes the Missouri Lottery. Would you be open to that amendment? Nothing's off the table. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Further questions on House Bill 223? Too far. Proceed. My only question is, as far as, I guess, I, I kind of get what, understand what you're getting at as far as disseminated to the general public, like maybe a public service announcement, like Durham on television or on the radio. Do you have any type of idea, ball, rough ballpark, how much is being spent in each office or cumulatively or in aggregate by all the offices? No, I mean, I, I, I don't. Okay. While we're publicly identifying issues, the attorney, here's another issue to consider. Attorney General could settle a case, and there could be so many uh, Missourians who are eligible to receive funds from the settlement of that case that it makes more sense 
to advertise the settlement in public than it does to contact them each individually. Maybe that ought to be something that's exempted, exempted out. Now we'll open the hearing on House Bill 225. <clears throat> uh, House Bill 225 has two main components. Uh, the first stipulates that any person appointed by the governor to board a commission uh, that requires Senate confirmation uh, must file a financial interest statement uh, as well as provide a listing of all their political contributions to, to a candidate or committee in the previous four years. Uh, the information is uh, compiled by the Ethics Commission and passed through the potential nominee to the President pro tem in the Senate. Uh, the second component simply says the Governor shall not appoint or offer to appoint uh, any member of the General Assembly to any position and attempt to influence legislation. Um, I think that one pretty much speaks for itself. Um, I think these are two, um, again, uh, needed elements to provide a little more clarity and transparency in, in, in this case to the gubernatorial appointment process. We've had a, a few instances uh, that, that, that come to memory uh, in the last six or so years with uh, folks making accusations of, of quid pro quo in the governor's office and some questionable timing of appointments, et cetera. Um, and so, and, and while I certainly have no, no knowledge to speak of the, the true nature of, of those instances, I, it seems like common sense, especially in the, the financial uh, realm of, as, as far as contributions go just again to provide some more context make sure that the Senate has all the information that they need to make the right decision on whether uh, this person uh, should be appointed or not so um, again pretty self-explanatory take let's take any questions representative <laughs> proceed isn't this information as to the political contributions already readily available to every member of the Senate and every member of the general public by just doing a search Sure. So, I, I mean, and I, don't I don't know that I necessarily have a problem codifying that, but it just seems to me that if it's already available, um, anybody that wants to politicize one of the gubernatorial appointments or make hay out of the contributions that were made, that can already be done. So why is it that the nominee then has to do, do a request, and I don't even know uh, to whom the request is supposed to be made, uh, to whom is, I guess it says, from the Ethics Commission. So they make a request from the Ethics Commission, and and then the Ethics Commission shall deliver it to the nominee, uh, who then delivers it to the President pro tem. I mean, it, at a minimum, it seems to me that it could go directly from Ethics to the President pro tem and cut out the middleman. But more importantly, again, why are we require, making this requirement of the Ethics Commission when I believe that all, you know, I mean, I can search Mitten and come up with every contribution I've given personally or my husband's given, and so why do we have to codify it? Well, I think for one, it is, uh, it probably ends up being more for the good of the general public maybe than it does for the good of, of, of um, uh, you know, the, 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 the Senate folks have staffers that are, you know, able to do those things and have the knowledge to know that those things are available. Uh, I think a lot of people, uh, maybe that follow politics um, not as closely as we do, uh, maybe don't understand all of the, the resources that are available to them. Um, and, and again, this is, as we talk about, and I think the, the uh, bills that Representative Barnes is gonna introduce today, this is a, a, a wide view of, of ethics reform as a whole. And, and uh, you know, I think that there have been some instances where uh, you know, maybe this information is, is, is useful and provides context not only for uh, the Senate that is obviously making the decision whether to confirm or not, but also just to the process and to the context for the general public. And so we're doing that. We do that a lot for, or we want to do more of that for the work that we do at the legislative, at, at legislative level. And I'm not sure that's a bad thing to, to make available for um, the executive as well. Well, and not to be too contrary, but it is Monday. Um, <laughs> How does it help the general public if it's in the hands of the Senate of the uh, President Pro Tem? Well, I think it's information that inevitably, probably, if it's if it's information that is would would cause um, the Senate to pause, would have concern about a particular appointment. Inevitably, that's probably information that that, that uh, gets out to the general public. You don't think that they're already doing this? Well, I'm not sure that. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure they maybe do it in particular instances. I, I'm not in the Senate, so. Is there a fiscal net? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Have you requested one? Yeah, I actually do have a fiscal note, and it's zero. And it's zero? Yep. Okay. Right here. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does that mean you're going to be less contrary on Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to inquire, proceed. Um, philosophically, like the bill, uh, my, my only question is on section 105.1420 about governor not appointing or offering to appoint. How is that in any way different than 105.452, where it says an elected or appointed official may not act or refrain from acting by reason of any payment offered to pay, promised pay, or receipt of anything of actual pecuniary value? It seems like 105.452 covers this exact quid pro quo that 105.1420 attempts to cover, but maybe in a slightly more general way. Um, I don't have. The, the other one that you mentioned in front of me, it, and if I heard you right, it would probably that 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 probably is aimed more at the legislator. Is that correct? It would it would appear to be so. So it probably hits the same objective. Uh, this one is obviously aimed more at the at the uh, governor than it would be the, the legislator. So the other side so, the so maybe we have you know maybe it does the same thing, or maybe you cover both sides of the point. Okay. It possibly we could, I mean, I, I don't really care as long as we get to the same result. It, it seems that 452 <coughs> seems to be attempting to do somewhat the same thing as 1420. Maybe we could yeah. put those in the same statute yeah. number. Further questions of the sponsor? Representative Cornell. Proceed. All right, so can you walk me through your, your reasoning as far as this whole process as opposed to doing just the nominee directly delivers a report to the president pro tem of the Senate of who he or she has given campaign contributions to in the last what, four year period. Because to me, you know, it's almost like you're creating a liability for the ethics commission in the sense that if I give a $99 campaign contribution to somebody, they're not required to individually list me on an ethics report. And so you're gonna miss out on a I think a, a decent amount of campaign contributions if I go to somebody's you know, $25 reception. In which case, I, I would think that if you did something along the lines of directly from a nominee to the president pro tem of the Senate, you would catch a lot more yeah. political uh, contributions than this process that you've set up. This, the, that, that particular language wasn't a part of um, the, the, the guidance that was given to us or that, that we gave to uh, legislative research in drafting this. So I, I, there is no real reason why that chain is the way that it is. And so, I, and I agree, we could, I'm, I'm sure we could probably cut out the middleman and, and that not be a bad thing. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Further questions? Seeing none, I'm gonna open the hearings on the four bills that I've sponsored. Okay. And Representative Hurst, you're in charge. <coughs> that out-of-state expenditures um, incurred by a lobbyist on any member or member elected to the General Assembly uh, or other person holding an elective office in state government uh, has to be reported within 14 days of the time that it occurred. Uh, requires the Ethics Commission to update its electronic filing system to accommodate the new time limitation. Under existing law, these items are typically included in a personal financial disclosure at the end of the year, or they might be included in a quarterly report. It, it depends, I think, on the nature of the expenditure. Um, if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them on House Bill 226. Thank you, Representative. Any questions for the sponsor? Do you know? I think. And, and I think this might apply to one of your other bills as well, Representative, which is we're talking about expenditures by lobbyists, but not necessarily expenditures by the principals. 
Am I getting that right or am I missing something? As drafted now, says lobbyists, I'd be open to including a okay. principal as well. And then, and then, does this have? In, in I, I'll just be honest. So I have um, my understanding is that there is a couple of ways to skin the cat of uh, sen of the, the fallout from Senate Bill Eight Forty Four, and and that. Well, hold on. Explain to me, Senate well, Bill just that stuff. Mm, well, so Senate Bill Eight Forty Four passes. It's actually in the statute. Then the Supreme Court uh, overturns it, or most of it, or the parts that we're dealing with. But then it still it, it still exists in statute. So when you're looking for bold and bracket, it's, it, it can be somewhat confusing. Yeah. So uh, if you can't bear with me on on just trying to, and again, there's, there, I've seen bills that have everything that was said of Bill A44 bracketed out and then basically put back in. Um, so sometimes it's a little bit hard to follow since there's not a tried and true way of doing it. So to, to that extent, I do ask you to bear with me. Does this limit the amount of any of the expenditures, or it just requires the reporting? This bill requires reporting. Okay. There's a, there's a bill later that limits oh, that's the, limit. the and, amount. And this is only for the out-of-state expenditures within 14 days made by a lobbyist. That's correct. And and again, is there any fiscal note? I, I can't imagine there would be any cost, but is there a fiscal note to extend the e-filing requirements by MEC? I'm not aware of the fiscal note at this time. Okay. Right? I think if there is a fiscal note, it would likely be minimal. No, yeah, I would, I, I, yeah, that seems to me the case as well. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? Representative Gordon, Gordon, Gordon. Gordon. <coughs> Proceed. So I'm just wondering how the, the reimbursement process would work. If, is there anything, you know, if, if a lobbyist were to pay for me for something outside the state and I were to reimburse them for that, is there any reimbursement process, or is it as soon as they spend the dollar, it has to be reported, or do they still have a kind of a ten-day window, or what? How do you envision that process? Well, if there's an expenditure that is paid back, you've got a 14 days. I don't, I don't know that it would qualify as an expenditure if it's paid back within those 14 days. Right. And it might make sense in some circumstances if somebody's. If there's a trip being organized, if you're going to pay them back, rather than to organize together, I, yeah. But I think if it's paid back within 14 days, thank you. I don't know that it qualifies. Further questions? Seeing none, to get you up to speed, uh, Representative Barnes will be presenting House Bills 226, 228, 330, 331. We'll do it in numerical order, uh, just like we said earlier. At that time, then we'll open it up to the public. So, thank you for House Bill 226. Please proceed with House Bill 228. House Bill 228 is short and simple. It's a revolving door bill, sets a limit at one year. This is the same policy I understand as the United States House of Representatives. And if there are any questions that we have to answer, any questions? To inquire. Representative Harper. <coughs> Philosophically, again, like like it. How does this does this in any way interfere with the right to contract in Missouri? Well, no one is is forcing anyone to be a state representative or a state senator. I don't know that, um, and I, I think we have all kinds of laws that limit the right to contract in Missouri. So sure, yeah, this does limit the right to contract for. Uh, organizations that employ lobbyists, they can't employ a small class of citizens for one year, and it limits the right to contract in, in that regard, but I don't necessarily see every limitation on the right to contract as a it problem. Feel, it feels like a non-compete agreement, which I know we're talking about two separate from the legislature to the lobbying corps, um, and I know non-competes have generally been upheld with two limitations, the um, time limit, which I don't think would be the problem, but the geographical scope, it seems like you're saying basically in the whole state of Missouri you can't perform this certain duty. Um, I assume legally there's not problems with that? I, I wouldn't see a problem I, with it. I mean, this is where um, the General Assembly meets. I don't. I don't think this violates. Alleged lobbying. Yeah, still problem. The, the other. 
Chris, that is, these are interesting questions. So I haven't thought about the scope of a, a, of a non-compete agreement. But non-compete agreements, they're generally within the same scope. I'm trying to think of the legal theory by which non-compete agreements are, are defeated. Don't they generally come from? Uh,